Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running Virtual Roundtable, where we, a group of doctor, doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of running and the stuff that we're putting on our feet. Today is episode number 83. We are extremely excited to be having a, a guest with us who we cite all the time when we think about running shoes and how we're thinking about prescribing them to different people in our practices. So this is a really exciting guest for us today. It's Dr. Jeff Burns. Dr. Jeff Burns is a physiologist and engineer with expertise in running. He works for the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee as a sports psych uh, physiologist, and he conducts research at the University of Michigan. He, his work focuses and focused on running biomechanics and performance. Jeff himself is a runner himself and competes internationally in ultra marathons. He was the 2016 USA national champion in the 100 kilometer and finished fifth at the world championships for the 100K twice, both in 2016 and 2018. So there's kind of not a better person to bring on this podcast because you're in the world of research and the world of shoes. Uh, it's just a, a huge gift to have you on, Jeff. So thanks for joining us. It's absolutely my pleasure. Um, these are, you know, you guys and your audience are, yeah, you're my people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited, excited to talk through, talk through any of the stuff that we're going to talk through with you guys today, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, get some gears spinning in, in people's heads. Fantastic. Rounding out everything is Matt and DJ and myself, so the, the regular people here on the podcast. What we're going to do first is our subjective for the week. This is, Jeff, where we ask a question to everybody and uh, just kind of get a gauge on what they think about this topic. So the subjective this week is what is your hardest or worst race experience you've ever had? And from that, what did you learn from it? So, Jeff, we're going to pitch this question to you. It'll give us a little picture into your ultra I mean, I'm assuming maybe your, one of your hardest was an ultra marathon at some point, but what would you say for, for that question? Yeah, uh, that's, that's actually, I would say that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> there have been, there have been lots of hard races, but, um, the one that I know I went the deepest on and was, was, you know, really, I like to say, you know, we're we're a sponge when we race, and you try and wring as much water out of that sponge as you possibly can. And it was the the 2018 World Championships in the 100K that mm -hmm. I I got the most out of myself that I think I ever have. And it was, yeah, it was it was it was a really hard race. So it was in Croatia, oh. um, and it was in uh, yeah northern Croatia by the border of. Um, Slovenia wow. um and it's a it's a wine region and I love like I'm a wine guy <laughs> I love wine but the thing that makes great wine are slopes uh. and not mountains but slopes and so the course is just up and down non-stop it's 100 kilometers and so it's loops and that's what most most of these world championships are looped courses so it's the seven and a half kilometer loop through you know just very just rolling train oh. so there's no flat on this seven and a half kilometer loop that you then do ad infinitum <laughs> over and over so it's just this like bacon strip over and over so the course is tough but it's in the summertime it's in uh september and it was humid so it's hot and humid so it was like you know 70s 70s and like i can't remember the specific humidity percentages but it was it was very 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 humid so it's hot, humid, rolling, which is just brutal conditions, which I actually, it's hard to race in, but I love that because I, I think it's one of those things where it's like everybody has to deal with it. And if you prepared well for it, then that you can kind of showcase that, but it still makes it really hard. So anyways, the conditions were tough. Um, but what made the race so challenging was it was probably the most stacked field that there had ever been in the 100K World Championships because you had... Um, like the South African team has a bunch of guys who have won comrades who are on it. So they're kind of the, the horses. Mm -hmm. And then the Japanese team, they brought really a full squad of guys who, you know, had just broken the world record that had stood for decades. Um, former world champion on their team, as well as a handful of other guys wow. who had run some of the fastest times ever. And so they brought a full stable. And then, of course, you know, other athletes from around the world. Um, so it was really absolutely a, a stacked field terrible conditions and i was in i knew i was in the best shape of my life going into it um and so the race got off and going through and i was uh 
um, through some of the race, I was out front with one of the Japanese guys. So it kind of went, went to plan and, um, we were running pretty quick for how hilly and, and hot it was. But as anybody who's run an ultra marathon knows, like, like about two thirds of the way through the race, like you get past half point, it's halfway and it starts to get tough. But then you get like three quarters of the way in once you get like 70 K 80 K and you just, you could have a great day or a bad day, but you're still in hell. It's still a horrible, horrible place. <laughs> um, and so at this point too, the sun is, you know, it's now noon and the sun is high in the sky and it's just getting hotter and hotter cooking us. Um, and so by, by now I had kind of shaken out and I was in fifth place and I was thinking, I'm like, you know, I'm like, man, in this field, if I can be top five, that's incredible. Like that's, I was thinking like incredible day. I can be top five. But the problem with the looped course is, you know, and I'm at, at this point in kind of the despair of survival, <laughs> like this is rough, got to keep going. But <laughs> your looped course, so you can see all of your competitors, you know, and especially because there's there's hairpins at both ends. Oh my gosh. So you go by them each time. And right around, it was like around 70, 75K, I started like started really feeling the heat, really feeling the hills and my body was just starting to shut down. And I see, uh, it's kind of like old, he's a friend and a rival from Sweden. His name's Fritjof Fagerland. So Fritjof and the former multi-time world champion, Giorgio Calcaterra from Italy, are both coming up. And each time we go around this loop, they're getting closer and closer and closer. And when you're at a dark point in a race, and you get this, you certainly get this even in marathons, but sometimes in shorter races, where when you, when you feel that momentum shift, mm -hmm. And it's and you're on the wrong side of that momentum. It just snowballs this like negative psychology. And so I'm feeling them getting closer and closer every lap, but also in that sense of just like utter despair of like I don't even know how I'm gonna finish this race. And so I'm just thinking, I'm like, I have to, I worked so hard to get to top five and it's like if they get me and there are there are other guys coming as well, and I can see them and I'm like, if this falls apart and they catch me, then that's like a huge opportunity and enormous preparation wasted. And so I'm feeling this and by like three laps to go, we're now past like 80 K. I don't even know how I'm moving forward and I'm <laughs> like holding them off, but they're getting closer and closer and they can feel it. And on the flip side, they're feeling the momentum and they're like coming on me and like it's feeding into it. And I'm just thinking it's, the, I mean, the feeling that it is, is like being on the gallows of like the noose around your neck. Oh. Like these guys are coming to take my day and I can't do anything about it because I'm dying. <laughs> and then it just became this thing of like, all right, well, I'm going to die. They're going to catch me, but it's not going to be in this stretch of road. Uh -huh. And then you finish that stretch of road and it's like, okay, I'm going to die, but it's not going to be in this stretch of road either. And then you just take it and it's like, I'm going to die, but it's not going to be in this moment. Then you get to the next moment and it's like, I'm going to die, but it's not going to be in this moment. And so just keep going like that. And by some, like, I don't know, they didn't catch me by the last lap, but they were getting really close. And so then I get to the last lap and I'm like, I'm dead, but I made it to this point. I can't, like, I can't lay down now. I just have to, like, I have to go yeah. somewhere deeper and keep going and it just truly became that thing of like 10 more meters and just like huh. you're not you're not going to give up you're not going to give up in this breath you're not going to give up in this breath like and finally i couldn't it and again anybody who's kind of raced this longer stuff knows like at that point it's like every single you can't even fathom the like distress you're in at that point where it's like every meter feels like a mile uh Sorry for the mixture of uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, maybe I should. We're not that, judging. That I think highlights it because meters, <laughs> meters, meters, and kilometers are superior units. So to say it feels like a mile is kind of an insult yeah. to the meter. <laughs> um, so anyway, so it's just like dragging on, and so finally it's this last lap. I'm holding him off, and and I think I thought I had held off Preach off, but Giorgio was coming in hot on me. And like the Italian Federation had people all up and down and I can just hear them cheering. Like, I know he's like 30 seconds behind me, but I had like stalled the momentum and we're just going, going, going. And finally, and then I hear other cheers and I don't know who that is, but so finally get into like the last kilometer and it's like the, the home stretch where you have everybody cheering and I can, I'm not looking back. I'm never looking back. 
but I can hear the, the time of the cheers. And so I'm going, and then like 10 seconds later, I hear people screaming for Giorgio. And then we go through this long tunnel where all the tables are that's like 400 meters from the finish, and it's like slight uphill. And I can hear people screaming for Giorgio because he's closing oh, in gosh. on me. And I'm just like, no, just get to the end of this tunnel. Like, if, if you get to the end of this tunnel, at least you put up a fight. And then so I get to the end, and he still hasn't caught me. But now I know he's like five seconds behind. Oh, my gosh. And the finish line is just right around the corner. And so now we're 100 meters, and he's right down my – he's like steps behind me. And so I just start sprinting. But then what I didn't know was now Kazami, Japanese guy – um, who had just set the world record. You're in 609 for the 100. Oh my gosh. So he, he, like smashed the world record. Yeah. Um, he had went out, he was up front early on, but kind of then passed him later. And he had rallied big time apparently and had just this crazy fast last lap. He whipped by Giorgio and then was coming up on me. And so it's the end of the race. And I'm like up on my toes. I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm like, I'm 50 meters from the finish. I'm not losing in a sprint to any of these guys. <laughs> like, Ron, Ron Walters was my coach, and, you know, he's a famous middle distance coach. And I can just hear him yelling at me, like, go to my arms, go to my arms, like, keep it tight. And, like, so I'm like, I'm not losing in a sprint to any of these guys. So I'm going, going, going. Like, and I end up barely out leaning oh now my gosh. at the line. He comes across, like, stumbles, collapses to the ground. Giorgio comes by, like, a second later. And I just, I finished it, and I was just overjoyed. By the way, there's, like, um, Brian Powell from I Run Far captured all of it, both on video and on, like, a couple pictures. Mm -hmm. It has this incredible sequence. And I'm sure it was, like, this super intense moment for me, but I bet if you were watching it from the side, it looked like just a (laughs) clown show of people sprinting at the end of this hockey mid-race. But anyways, I finished the race, and I mean, I was punching, like, oh, my gosh, I, like, held on to fifth place, and it's, like, world champion breathing down my neck, like, world record holder. And the crazy thing, though, is, like, I was overjoyed at the moment, but then, like, I walk out of the tunnel, and I go to the, like, our athlete hotel is right next to the, um, uh, right next to the, like, the finish line thing, and there's, like, so I walk in the side door and there's a vestibule and I, and I like stand in the vestibule and then I just kind of like sit down and I just started crying, mm. like sobbing. And it wasn't tears of joy. It was the weird, it was the weirdest mm. feeling I've ever had in my life. It was this feeling of like, I hit my limit at like 75 or 80 K, but I just had to keep going. Huh. And it was the, it was that feeling. It was almost like traumatic relief of like, oh, I wow was staring at death Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like and it like for some reason like used more coin than i had to hold it off and and it was just this weird utter feeling of like of like i can't believe i did that to myself Mm -hmm. and like (laughs) not consciously thinking that but i think my body was like saying that but i was just like sobbing and it was like oh my gosh and i got up and like got myself together and yeah it was a very strange experience but i've never i've never had anything like that and it's like it was it kind of like in a weird way scarred me because it's like i don't don't, don't go through that that again again. (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah that was a crazy that sprinting holding off for 20k of the last 100k and then having to sprint at the end (laughs) was it was something else what an incredible story i that was my last, that was probably my last race in uh, normal shoes as well. <laughs> what did you run oh, what fair. did you run that in? That was in uh, Ultra Escalante. But interestingly, that was that was one of the first years that the Vaporfly became widely available. So that was like now now, you know, he set the world record in those shoes and so he had them. A handful of the Japanese guys did, the South African guys wow. did. So so yeah, I'll ju- I, I don't want to like make qualifications, but I'll say like <laughs> I think of the four guys in front of me, I think two or three of them, I think three, yeah, three of them were wearing them because um, yeah, Bang Musa um, and two Japanese guys, and then uh, but crazy Hideki Yamauchi, uh, Japanese, the guy who won it, uh, world champion, was not. He was an Adios boost. Wow, so I can't make excuses. Incredible. There. He's just a boss. That's anyways. Cool. So, well, sorry. Well, a Long great time. story. I mean, <laughs> great stories are great stories. And it's funny, like, your, it's cool how your 
hardest race experience, but still a triumph. And you have some cool ideas of just like this straight away or this straight away or this straight away. And for me, I'm not a, I'm not a super competitive runner. I, I like to run. Um, and I go in races, but I'm not actually competing against the people except for one time, like one five mile race. I actually was like competitive with the field just because I'm from a smaller town and the experience of just being around other runners and having that as a whole other factor. Cause most of the time I'm just running a marathon basically against myself. And so that's a whole, that factor of people coming up on you or seeing them in front of you and how you deal with that mentally and what you choose to do. And for you, segmenting it down to smaller, smaller pieces to be able to take steps forward. Pretty cool. So if you guys want to share your hardest race experience with us, um, you can do it through Spotify. We always put the question up there. Otherwise, uh, this, video we always release on Fridays right now. And so you could go on YouTube at that point and comment there or email us at doctors of running podcast at gmail.com and just share your story. And we like to tell other people's stories. Uh, so if you want us to share that, we're hoping to share a couple stories next week that are, have some good lessons or some inspiration for others. So thanks Jeff for sharing that. And, um, I don't think I'm ever going to do a 100 K, but we'll see. <laughs> We'll see. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> here's here's my cool. traumatic like, experience. Yeah, Let me inspire you to do this too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, it sounds worth it though. I, and I don't I don't have any I don't have any that I could share with you that I could say for hundred Ks that were like, Yeah, it was a joy to run. <laughs> no, they're all really hard. <laughs> and that's a whole other topic. Um, like what brings somebody to go do that to themselves? Over and over. I don't know, it's weird. That's what Bruce Fordyce, famous comrades you know, multi-time champion always says, he's like, you get, you know, comrade. So comrades is about 90 kilometers long. It's like you get past 70 K and you're just swearing at yourself. Like, never again. Why would I do this? Never again. And then you finish the race. And a lot of times you're thinking that was awful. Never again. But then two weeks later, you're just thinking like, all right, I'm going. For Can it I do again. this again? <laughs> I'm signing up. There, there's a psychological um, term for this that happens with the same thing with childbirth, where for whatever reason, there's a your brain seems to forget or like blocks it out. But you lose that memory, so you're like, it wasn't that bad. When in the moment, you're like, that was horrible. I'm never doing this again. So I forget what that's called. Somebody comment below what that's. There's a there's a term for that. Yeah. I forget what it is. I heard I heard a, um, a psychologist yeah. talking about that same thing, yeah. and I, I think it's like a superpower of of humans, yeah. and maybe not a superpower, but it's our ability to like forget or not, yeah, not be able to carry very extreme negative, you know, emotions and sensations. Mm -hmm. It's like that, yeah, that selective selective memory. Yeah. But and it's that I think it's one of the interesting things that getting back to like. I always thought about this, you know, when I was, say when I was first starting running competitively in like middle school and high school, you can never, like this was something that always made me curious, but you can never experience the, you know, some people call it the pain that you have in a race, but really that distress that you go through, you can't experience that, not in the moment. Like you can't remember it. You can't, it's just this weird thing. Mm. And, and maybe it is, I think it is a superpower of humans because we have this amazing cognitive capacity. But if we did have that ability to remember it, we'd never go do hard things again. Yeah, <laughs> for real. So, <laughs> no, I feel, so, yeah. I feel bad not remembering this because they're actually studying that concept because there, there's some early research in the area of chronic pain and individuals that are experiencing that, realizing that mechanism may not, not only is not working for whatever reason huh. for them, but actually has reversed where sometimes things will become even more sensitive or blown up. And I'm not, I'm, hopefully I'm not saying this the wrong way, but we, our brain may change the interpretation of it in a different sense. And so there's a huge area in the chronic pain research that's looking at this. And so that makes it's sense. a superpower. I don't know if it always works the way we expect, but it is very fascinating how yeah. our brains can like at times create selective memories on this stuff and when it's hopefully when it's yeah beneficial not always but yes right awesome well thanks jeff for that story get a little bit about your running uh but i'm going to kick it to matt matt's going to kind of lead the interview here about kind of your educational background and then diving into our topic for the day it's really about foams and talking about them from a ton of different angles what we know about them what we don't looking at it biomechanically looking at it Injury-wise, we'll go into everything. But, uh, Matt, I'll kick it over to you. 
Yeah, so I, I'm super excited to talk to Jeff just because he wrote a landmark, well, I think it's a landmark article back in 2019, 2018 called, Is It the Shoes? A Simple Proposal for Regulating Footwear and Road Running. And I, we reference this all the time as well as his, some, some of his other works. But I encourage people to read this just because there is a lot of good information out there in the research world. There's some kind of arguments that happen in terms of marketing that I think people have not quite caught up on. And I encourage people to read this because even though this is a couple years old now, it is still very relevant. So on that topic, Jeff, would you mind talking people through a little little bit of your educational background, your research focus and how you got into that? And then let's transition into foams after that, especially with, cause it's so interesting. Yeah. So I'm, um, you guys know, like, just talk through that. I'm I'm a runner, and and I have been. I was born and raised in in the sport of running. My dad is a coach, uh, but before he was even a coach, he was himself a you know dedicated student of the sport, passionate runner. So I grew up around that. Um, you know, I grew up. I, I always joke. I feel like I like grew up in a shoe store because that's where his friends were, and that's where he hung out. And I worked <laughs> there and through high school and college. Um, but I, I, yeah, so I also, I studied engineering. And so I actually wrote, I wrote my, my uh, college entrance essay to the University of Michigan, um, trying to get into the, you know, get into biomedical engineering. I wrote my essay on that I wanted to design running shoes. Like, that's why I wanted a degree in oh biomedical gosh. engineering. Amazing. Um, and so I studied that. I did my bachelor's degree, did my master's degree in that. And that's a really, um, that was just such a, a wonderful um I would say educational preparation because it really gives you a breadth of engineering um, experiences in terms of mechanics, materials, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, all that stuff. But then also with the biological underpinning and essentially kind of like a pre-med curriculum. Mm -hmm. So kind of marrying those two. Um, But as I moved through that, I I also, um, yes, took a lot of classes in different areas, got interested in different things. Um, you know, I took a lot of classes in our business school and became really interested in process optimization and things like that. And so I kind of moved away from running shoes a little bit, but worked as an engineer for a medical device company afterwards. Um, we did, we made pacemakers and, and leads, uh, cardiac leads for the pacemakers. Um, yeah. And then after that, I knew I started, I got the feeling that I'm like, okay, I'm a science, I'm a scientist. I, I, I love you know, I, I really love the academic pursuit. Um, and that's, you know, that's where my heart is. So I kind of knew I wanted to come back and do a PhD eventually. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do it in. And then for a few years, I actually worked as a biomechanics research engineer for the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Michigan. Oh. So I was working with surgeons and residents to do research, uh, to essentially do set up you know, biomechanical um, research investigations into there's surgical procedures, um, you know, testing whether it's suture strengths or um, different plate fixations on bones and, and things like that. So I that was really that I think set me up in a really unique way to move into kinesiology and sports sciences because I was, I mean, I was working a lot with cadaveric material, um, and so I was, I, you know, there were times where daily I was doing cadaveric dissections because we'd have, you know, projects where mm-hmm. we were doing it on, you know, human tissue. And, you know, a lot of, like a lot of, like our surgical residents, they would go through the entire, their entire residency and have maybe four or five dissections. And I was getting to do it like every day. And so like understanding, and at the same time, I'm getting to do materials testing on you know, this human tissue. Yeah. So I'm ripping tendons and breaking bones and, and doing all this stuff. And it's like, and so that was, you know, doing that for a couple of years before coming back to school was, was something that was really informed. I think my understanding of anatomy and physiology really well, as well as mechanics. So anyways, did that. And then knew, you know, I trying to figure out what I wanted to do my PhD in, but I, you know, my, I knew in my heart it had to be something related to running. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be able to do that with, um, Ron Zernicke. He was, uh, he was formerly Dean, um, of our school of kinesiology stepped down um, from that, and I got to be his. I got to be his PhD student. At, you know, after he stepped wow. down, and he had, I mean, he's had a long illustrious career, uh, especially in you know, biomechanics of injury and stuff. Like at that. Michigan as well, um, right? 
Yeah, Dang, that's a lot of yep, that's a lot of Michigan. Sorry, how much of a Michigan sports fan are you? I'm a Badger, so I went to Wisconsin. Oh, um, okay. See, I, I don't have animosity towards. Wisconsin. I feel the same way. Um, I, I like Wisconsin. Oh, I like Wisconsin. My father in law is a um, Michigan fan too. So like, there, I okay. I hate Ohio State. So like, we yeah. have a common enemy. Oh yeah, we're friends. Cool. So, I just yeah. wonder if you have any if you have any Ohio State fans in the audience, they can they can just shut up. They really don't need uh, to listen. We don't want you to follow yeah. us. <laughs> Yeah, they wouldn't understand anything. Else, I should say. <laughs> I'm yeah. um, For good anyways, reason. Yeah. I mean, that's our, wor- our so comment. We're just going to get so much stuff in our comment section on this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, but on the flip side, any Michigan fans, you know, will will really rally around. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I was going to say that's the reason why college sports are awesome because they are outlet for irrational hatred. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, no, actually, so that is. It is one of those things, right? I grew up loving the University of Michigan. I'm from okay. Michigan originally. Um, I I joke at the end. I had I had so I've, I have now three degrees from the University of Michigan, um, as well as a postdoctoral fellowship, and I think it was 258 credit hours. Oh my gosh! So have you paid oh, Michigan for- more than they've paid you? Have you done the math on this? That's actually a really good question. <laughs> That's, That's a great it's question. Probably you know you look at like a graduate student stipend um yeah i think we're probably i don't know if i hit the break even point by the end of my phd fellowship or not um cool yeah so anyways awesome but yeah so a lot of university of michigan but i i love it and that's actually why i wanted to do my phd there phd there because like and in addition to that i had worked you know worked there but i was like i know one i love this institution and it fires me up to do great work here but two i also at that point had understood the structures of it. And for anybody who has moved around in academia, I saw, like, if I went to another institution, I was like, I know there's going to be a lot of hurdles, like trying to learn, just learn the ropes Mm -hmm. of everything. Whereas I knew, you know, I knew people all over campus. I knew the resources I went to. So yeah, it allowed me to be more efficient with my work for sure. But yeah, I absolutely love that university. Cool. So yeah, so that was, I did my PhD and then studied running biomechanics. Um, my my work focused on modeling runners as spring systems, essentially, like thinking of us uh, in a global mechanical sense rather than uh, the traditional joint level or limb level, you know, kind of, we'd call it component level analysis. Eight factors of movement um, or Rather six. than looking at what, yeah, rather than what, looking at like what the knee or the shank or the ankle is doing, um, studying, yeah, how the runner behaves as a system as a whole. Um, so some of your audience might have heard the term, you know, terms like leg stiffness or things like that. And that's really, that's, that's kind of what I was studying runners as, is this bouncing spring system. Mm-hmm. Um, so part of my work was developing new methods using that idea of a runner as a bouncing system to, to study us. And then part of it was applying existing methods um, to study you know, new populations of runners. So I'd studied, um, you know, we had a study that I did collaborating with University of Cape Town, looking at Kenyan distance runners and how their spring behaviors differed. Um, had study, I had a study that I colloquially termed the biomechanics of the sub four minute mile. Mm-hmm. I had a bunch of elite middle yep. distance runners come through the lab and and uh, looked at their mechanical patterns and running economy and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, so I had the, the privilege and pleasure to do that. And then along the way, um, you know, shoes have always been uh, uh, an area of, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say like, int- I mean, I, it's, I wouldn't even say they're an area of interest. They're like, a, they're just this, this necessary, like if you are a runner by definition or by, um, by constitution, if you are a runner by constitution, your shoes are, that's part of your body. Um, and so I think most runners understand this, like, it's not even on an intellectual level. We just, they're just, they're, they're our shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've always, you know, I've always had a fascination and um, my mother would probably say an obsession. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, my dad would probably say, like, no, no. Like, yeah. It's just part of your body, of course. Um, yeah. You're, so anyway, you're at the so right crowd interested. right now. This is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so along the way, of course, um, the world 
the war the running world had a nice big earthquake in the form of footwear like halfway through my phd work or actually it was very early on in it um and that you know that certainly launched things and then you know i was fortunate enough to um get a, a little bit of a voice in that um and so yeah and so that kind of led us to where we are today and then after that i should have you know, now circuitously describing my path um I, I did my postdoctoral fellowship also at Michigan after <laughs> after I graduated. I, I defended I defended my dissertation in um, March of 2020. I was the last public event at the University of Michigan before the coronavirus pandemic wow. shut everything down. Friday, March 13th was yeah. my dissertation defense, and it was like things were shutting down all around and. But I was just like laser focused. I was like, no way. I've worked four years. I'm doing this in public. Um, and so right dur- it was actually during my defense that the university president said at noon, everything is closed, hard stop. Wow. And, you know, I finished at 1130 and, <laughs> wow. and then the world went silent, but I was OK with that. Um, and then so, yeah, then started my postdoctoral fellowship shortly thereafter and, you know, continued doing running research, um, has, have done some, some work with the phones. And then I just finished that, and in the last few weeks, just started as a physiologist with the Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Um, here, I'm at the training center in Colorado Springs, so a whole new adventure. Um, and, I mean, because that gets back to, yes, I love running, and it's my object of, you know, it's how I understand the world, but I truly love, I love it all endurance sport, but really love um, performance optimization and, you know, getting athletes, helping athletes win and to do it at the highest level is not just a dream but but really kind of how um yeah how i want to both challenge myself and and potentially have the opportunity to have a a cool impact with with our uh our best and brightest So, so speaking of the optimization as someone who's written about so i encourage everyone listening to go check out his article on the the bouncing behavior of sub four minute milers is a phenomenal article that really has some great information that can help you understand how the body is kind of moving and how it starts to move in, say, an elite athlete. And some of these behaviors and these biomechanical principles that often are not addressed in, in, in terms of the things that running shoes and running companies will tell you about. You know, it's not just the shoe. There's other components when it comes to running. People become, not that we're judging, become very like focused on the shoe and there's a lot of impact. But I guess the biggest question is for our listeners – there's a lot of new stuff coming out in terms of foams, in terms of plates and stuff like that. And I'd encourage them also to, to read the article that you wrote that I referenced earlier on some of the different components. But what would you t- what would you want the audience to know in terms of how are these shoes impacting our biomechanics? I know it's a very broad question, but if you were going to try to simplify that down into a, into a you know really straightforward thing, what would you tell people that and maybe things that they need to be aware of that they may not be thinking of? beyond perhaps performance so yeah so how how the running shoes affect our biomechanics um i mean it's yeah it's that's a big that's a big a big a big area (laughs) (laughs) um i think a good place to start is to think um yeah is to think of running shoes as essentially portable surfaces on our feet. So the surfaces on which we run like have distinct effects on our bodies. And running shoes really are that. You know, we're putting a new surface on our foot. Because otherwise, you know, let's think about running barefoot. Um, that has its own very distinct mechanics. But as soon as we put, um, you know, if you're running barefoot on different surfaces, you have different, you know, different essentially interactions. Think of running on asphalt versus on grass. Um, it's a very different experience for your body. And one of the interesting things that happens when we run on different surfaces is when we run on surfaces of different uh, stiffnesses. So this this term will probably, no, this term will come up a lot in the conversation and already has, but we'll really quick define stiffness for your audience. Um, so stiffness is by definition, um, a force over displacement. So how much force a given thing changes in distance. (laughs) So you can think of, uh, you know, a spring, the stiffness of a spring, 
if you stand on a spring and it compresses down 10 centimeters and then you stand on another spr- on another spring that's the same length and it compresses down 20 centimeters um, that first spring is twice as stiff if that makes mm-hmm. sense so you can think of it for a given force the amount that something displaces um, or you know conversely for a given displacement the amount of force that could cause that so think about that so a very stiff thing will not displace very much under force a very compliant thing which is the inverse of stiffness will displace a lot under force anyways so surfaces that's one of the defining features of our different surfaces that we run on is different levels of you know stiffness um so that's one of the big ways that our bodies change as we run over surfaces um the softer and softer that a surface is we actually stiffen up our body to essentially counteract that and keep our our um, center of mass, our overall vertical bounce, consistent. So you essentially, as you run on softer and softer surfaces, it's paradoxical because it feels softer holistically in your body, but your body actually is tightening up range of motion and joints um, and just preserving that vertical bounce. Um, so anyways, so if we think of that on different surfaces, um, we then move that to shoes. And again, thinking of shoes as these portable surfaces on our feet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the same phenomenon happens where, where um, generally speaking, and this is, this is harder to study. And I think I can make these prognostications, but uh, like the research that we have on different levels of shoe compliance and when I say compliance, again, the inverse of stiffness. So shoes with, you know, essentially, um, you know, harder, stiffer midsoles versus softer ones. That's a really challenging thing to study, actually, because you essentially have to have the exact same shoe, but just changing the components of the foam. Because um, otherwise, there are so many other features of shoes that could, you know, alter your your interaction with, with the ground. Um, but moreover, what's also interesting is like, because that, that, um, that surface is now on your foot, if we're studying your holistic mechanics and we do that with force plates in the ground, your body, the shoe and the body is now striking the one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you, that, and that's one of the things that I think about a lot with some of these, some of these shoes um, especially the new generation is like, if we're studying, if we know the property of the shoe is changing. So if we know we have different foams or something, um, and we're seeing the same overall force characteristics come out of it, then the body must be doing something differently in them. Um, I think in, because in that topic, I think, I think one of the things we're, we're hoping you can kind of walk us through is, you know, some of it might be the stiffness of this foam underfoot. And right now, Mm -hmm. consumers have these options between a million different kinds of foams. A million is a big number. That's not actually how many, but you have, you hear terms like EVA, TPU, you know, PBACs. Like what, what do you know about each of those types of foams? Are there differences between them? And yeah, what, what do we know about those kinds of foams and which ones are out there? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that gets back to, um, I would say just to put a, to cap the last question of, you know, how the shoes affect our biomechanics, I would say it's incredibly multimodal in the sense of, you know, the foams, which we're now about to talk, talk about, you know, certainly have a bearing, but then of course there are many other pieces of shoes that, that can affect things, you know, architectural pieces. Now, obviously super shoes have these carbon fiber plates in them, but long before super shoes, we would throw in, different densities of foams to try and manipulate things. We'd put in plastic shanks to, you know, change the way the shoe bended longitudinally. Because again, thinking of this in a very simple sense, if you just have a piece of foam on your foot, um, the, when your foot moves and flexes over, you know, through stance, like that is just a simple foam might not be the best way to facilitate that um, so, you, you know, the, essentially you have to start putting in different, different things to kind of optimize that ground interaction and every single shoe and every single company have different elements of these and, and different, you know, whether that's changing the longitudinal bending stiffness of the shoe or, or, you know, altering things underneath, you know, the, the 
thickness of the shoe itself. All of these things do have different effects, which we could go down lots of <laughs> lots of rabbit holes. But I guess getting back to the foams, so we'll 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 stick to just we'll stick to foams for now because that's um, I don't want to say it's, it's not simple, but it's 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 straightforward and a little bit. All of those other things I mentioned are like enormously individualized, and that's why there's a lot of um, I'd say not uh, I would say not a ton of consistent conclusive research on different elements because every single person you know i i like to think of like our interaction with the ground it's like it's like it's a fingerprint or it's like it's a footprint <laughs> um you know no it really is it, like it's a very individualized thing because just just as your foot and i mean not just your foot but the way that you load your foot the way that you load your entire you know your body I, it is this interaction with the ground that it's this very unique dance and and the shoe is this kind of like um, medium for that in four dimensions and that you know it's this three dimensional piece but also every moment of it is slightly different mm-hmm. so it, so anyway so that individual interaction with all of those is is and that gets back to what we were saying earlier about it being kind of like an extension of your body it, it really is that thing where it's like different pieces interact with somebody's foot differently because you can have different strength in your you know lower limb like your foot has you know one of you can probably tell me how many how many bones are in your foot how many joints how many ligaments how many degrees of freedom is that and how a shoe can interact with it Whew. like <laughs> that is um yeah so anyways anyways getting back, all, all of that's to kind of wrap that up and say um yes shoes shoes all of these nuanced features of shoes actually one of the things that's you know even crazy about that, I used to I used to run um, run for I'm sure that you know the shoe company Ultra. Um, yeah. uh, had a sponsorship with them for a little bit, um, and I I did I loved I loved some of their early shoes, um, but one of the really interesting things was they they do this thing in a lot of their shoes. I'm not sure if they do anymore. I haven't I haven't run in them in years, but they it was called Interflex, where they like impose this grid mm-hmm. in the shoe to make it more flexible. And I started to realize that the shoes that I loved were early versions of their shoes that didn't have that. And when they put it in their shoes, it completely changed how I moved with the shoe mm-hmm. where it was like almost like too flexible for my foot. But the crazy thing is the the founder of the company, Golden Harper, like he loved it. Like it, it was so natural for him. It felt perfect. But where I was like the other end and it's like, there is no right or wrong. But like just that one subtle thing of, of changing the way the shoe bends can be drastically different for different people. Yeah. Um, and there's again no right or wrong. So so anyways, that's just. Me. I want to I want to getting back to phone quickly um, quickly paraphrase something yeah. really quick because you have touched on ex- like just something incredibly amazing and beautiful that we try to tr- get to our followers all the time and our readers is that please remember like we love reviewing these shoes and we're going to give you our interpretations of this. But you have to, you cannot remember it's the combination of your body and the shoe and the surface that you're running on. And so how you're going to interact with that shoe is more than likely going to be totally different than the next person. So you have to remember that, especially if you're watching, you know, elite athletes and what they're doing, how they interact with that shoe is likely to be different from how you interact with that. And that's why there's other variables you need to be thinking about, which we always talk about to people that, that follow us. We are trying to teach you more about you and helping you learn more about that because that's a really important piece for to figure out, is this shoe going to work for me? And sometimes you just got to try it out and see, and it may or may not. And that's that's kind of the beauty of what keeps this interesting. But yeah, that was yeah. my interjection. I love it. Music. That's music. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I, I was going to say the other thing too, uh, there are a lot of factors, but speed, the speed that you're running at. Um, influences that actually getting back to those the ultra shoes that i was telling you i love that like really flexible interflex thing that i did i actually found them to be really comfortable at like you know relatively slow paces you know so if i was doing an easy run at like eight or eight and a half minute mile pace i loved it but as soon as i started going faster like there's this like non-linear exponential increase of feeling like i was running in sand and a lot of the shoes that we run in um We'll have different. You'll have different interactions across speed because your forces are going to be different. The time that you're in, in contact with the ground will be different. Um, the way that you are kind of. It's funny, like le- that concept of leg stiffness of our body as a spring. 
we preserve the overall stiffness of our body as we move across faster and faster um, uh, at across speeds, but we tighten up the vertical stiffness. So like the amount that you bounce up and down. So that changes essentially the contact time that you're you know, in with the ground. So the way that you are, again, interacting with the ground as you go faster and faster changes with the shoe in order to maintain that kind of overall spring behavior. Mm-hmm. So another another dimension to add for your <laughs> listeners to remember um, whenever you're thinking about how a certain shoe feels, um, there's there there's likely going to be a, a speed element to it as well. I know I know we haven't gotten to the question, but I have a question on what you just said too. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll get there. <laughs> we got 15 minutes or so left. But um, when you when you say speed, do you mean absolute speed or do you mean relative speed, meaning effort per the person? Just to clarify mm-hmm. that. Um, no, that's actually a great question, uh, and I would say I was talking about absolute speed. Because that is, that is that is one element that that I think when we're talking strictly mechanically, yep. um, that is yeah that that is that that is something that has its own bearings in terms of again those ground contact because you really you know your body is this spring system, it the speed that it moves along is transposable to other speeds, but to your point about so I think there is that element and I actually just. Um, finished up a study with um uh dustin jubert at oh, nice. Stephen f austin university who did that nice i was gonna nice reference study the study the, the other super yep. shoes yeah so we just we just um he he did this like awesome awesome study looking at the shoes at slower speeds and and i came in to kind of help help analyze it and and work through the results and one of the things that observed was the essentially lesser effect of the shoes at these slow speeds um, and it's, and it, it is in that absolute sense, you know, we hypothesized it's because for probably two reasons where it's less forces, because as you're running slower and slower, even in an absolute sense. So at, you know, 12 minute mile pace, 10 minute mile pace, eight minute mile pace, um, sorry, the two speeds were t- about 10 minute mile pace and eight minute mile pace, 10 and 12 kilometers an hour. Um, yeah, that absolute, you know, it carries, there are mechanical requirements to move a body that yep. fast. Um, now, there is there is some relative sense in terms of body mass and, and weight when you're going those speeds. Um, but then to your point about relative speed, if you're talking about like, to, you know, relative to your 5K best speed or your best mile time or something like that, I think that's another one that maybe that's subject to more speculation. Yeah. But I think there is an element of that too, because we have, um, uh, I would say once you start to hit, once you go past your anaerobic threshold and certainly, certainly move towards even, um, yeah, move towards the upper domain of like how fast you can actually run. Like we have, we start to, I think our bodies have kind of like, uh, sort of like, it's almost like the you think of like the nonlinear viscoelastic material that like the harder you poke it, the harder it presses back. I think once we get to like closer and closer to our limits, we re- really do start to kind of change mechanical patterns. Mm. <laughs> uh, but I think on, on the spectrum of, of actual maybe distance running paces, um, it's it we can think much more in terms of relative or absolute, absolute speeds, speeds, but with the relative with the relative. Um, contribution maybe being more towards like body mass. Yeah. Um, when we're thinking about forces and, and times on the ground. The, the but, study you just yeah. worked on with Dustin, were those slower speeds done in runners where that's their selected pace for like a marathon or was it done in people who run as fast as maybe DJ or Matt or yourself? Yeah, there was a mix. Okay. It was yeah, a mix, um, cool. Now the, the criteria was that 12 kilometers an hour had to be you know, it had to be below the anaerobic threshold for them. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so there were some people that I actually think uh, we excluded one. Yeah. Uh, he had to he had to take one person yeah. out of it because they they tripped the lactate threshold. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, he had people who were um, I think maybe I have to go back and check the numbers, but you know, 15, 16 minute five k runners, so quite quite fast. Um, cool. But. But yeah, so a spectrum. That's great. It's kind of, that's for, for someone, like I say, like in my shoes, 
it's nice when you have, you know, doing studies, obviously it's hard to recruit all these things, but you can always think about perfect worlds. Like the perfect world would be people who max out at a 3.30 marathon or a four hour marathon or a four, four and a half or a five. And those are the ones studied at those paces and seeing if their difference in, in these shoe uses versus, and like you said, there's not pace isn't the only one, then you have body mass to play into it and all these other, there's a million factors, which makes it fun and hard. So. Yeah. And no, it, it is interesting though, because I mean, that was one of the, that bouncing behavior study had did show that at mm. very low speeds, elite runners versus highly trained runners, not even like elite versus recreational. Like and these are 350 milers versus 415 milers. <laughs> um, so very, very good runners at very slow speeds, they had very distinct oh, mechanics. Cool. I think to your point of like, you know, it is, it's one of the challenges with running research. Absolutely. Is like, is it's, yeah, it, there, are, there are just so many, say so many degrees of freedom in our populations of, runners right. of like, you know, ability that they're at speed that they're at, um, you know, and then of, of course, all those anthropometric features, body mass, but also, limb length, you know, preferred stride frequencies, things like that, that kind of really affect mechanics. muscle fiber distribution. Um, yeah, there you go Thanks so much. So, um, yeah, so definitely, definitely one of the challenges, but yeah. Cool. Should we go back, back to foams? Let's what is TPA? What is TPU? What is PBAX? <laughs> yeah. So that's, so getting back to, you know, thinking about the shoes, the major constituent of our shoes is the foam in them um and that's that drives our i would say our dominant interaction with the shoe um and yeah for a long time eva ethylene vinyl acetate was the ubiquitous foam in shoes and i believe i think foamed rubbers um so so just about all foams that we have out there are um, what we would call thermoplastic elastomers, which means that they are these uh, molecules that are elastic, behave kind of like springs, that um, you compress them or stretch them and they store the energy and to a large degree um, return it when you kind of take that away. Um, and so I believe there were early foams um, through the... You, certainly through the sixties was when they appeared, um, late sixties, we started to see them in running shoes and through the seventies. And I believe EVA came on the market in the seventies. And I think it was Brooks actually, that was the first company to use it. Um, but then ever since then, you know, we're nearly 50, I think it was 75 or 76 that they first used it. So we're almost 50 years on and, and it was, you know, it was the ubiquitous foam. And so what that is, is ethylene vinyl acetate. It is ethylene and vinyl acetate. And those are two polymers, um, so two chemicals. And you essentially put them together, um, make a soup with them, and then you foam them. You, you in, introduce air into that chemical soup and let it set mm. and you use what's called a blowing agent to get that out and expand it, and it turns it into a foam. Um, so otherwise, it would be, you know, like a, a milky resin. Um, and so, yeah, so by mm. introducing air, you essentially get this three-dimensional spongy material and it's it's in all sorts of things you know, not just running shoes like you go look at like i don't know the swimming noodles that you, you might have or like uh i don't know like uh shoot probably any foam you can find around the your padding house, on a backpack a or something. something right or padding on a backpack yeah um bike seat um, yeah. <laughs> i don't know well and now we're saying now i'm starting to get it i don't know if those are EVA. Um, yeah, they're they're definitely foam to last. Yeah, years. but uh, anyways, so EVA was this this foam that that um, dominated running shoes for a while because because it's what we call thermoplastic. It means that it can be uh, set under different temperatures and molded into different shapes, and so it became this thing that was really favorable for the running shoe industry because basically it was light, which is the thing that you absolutely need for running shoes. It's like your ticket to entry is is it needs to have a low density. But it, broadly speaking, was like pretty, um, it was soft. You know, you could, you could tune those, you know, and this is, again, gets to kind of the complexity of EVA. We, we throw around the term EVA, yeah. but EVA itself is this, enor there's enormous complexity in, in what it can be. You can have 
very soft EVAs, very stiff EVAs. You can have um, ones that are slightly more resilient, return more energy than others um, by different, you know, different ways that you, you can kind of play around that chemical soup of, of those. And, and also not just playing around with those soups, but also the, the blowing agents that you use um, can change the properties. So a lot of different ways to kind of manipulate it. But at the end of the day, um, it is a relatively crude chemical soup that can't overcome those limitations, you know, some of the limitations. So anyways, so we used it for many, many years because it was cheap, effective, um, and it kind of ticked all the boxes for a good running shoe. But um, yeah, then then I would say the first, the first uh, way, well, the other thing to mention here is there was, uh, there have been different foams that are in different shoes. So like polyurethane, which polyurethane is, um, you know, you could think of it as not in a foam form is like a form of rubber. Um, but polyurethane had been used a, a lot in foams and different shoe constituents. Um, the reason it wasn't widely used was, was because it was so much denser than EBA. So it was heavy, yeah. but it actually had really favorable energy return properties. Um, and so, yeah. So anyways, so that one, that one had kind of came and gone on the scene, but was not really a player in any major running shoes that we have. And then right around, I think 2012 or 13, um, we got the first kind of shakeup in the running shoe world of boost with Adidas, which is what's called TPU thermoplastic polyurethane. So again, polyurethane came back and that is, that is, um, yeah, a rubber, and it is also, again, in this this class, all all these foams are what, again what we call thermoplastic elastomers, and thermoplastic just means that um, you can use heat to change the change the properties, um, you know, at different stages in the process. Um, and anyway, so this thermoplastic um, polyurethane was taking polyurethane, which previously had been this kind of like dense foam, heavy foam, and Adidas working with BASF, chemical company, found a way to, to make what they call expanded thermoplastic polyurethane, which is they essentially made it into these little pellets. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were able to make it much less dense and much lighter. And then because it's a thermoplastic, they could then take all these pellets and put them together and essentially melt them after the fact into a shape um, mm -hmm. for a running shoe. And this this kind of shook shook the business up a little bit because it's um yeah it it had this property that EVA didn't have um, it had higher you know, quote unquote energy return and so the mechanical term we use for that is resilience so it returned more energy so for your audience like EVA EVA has a spectrum of of I would say properties. Um, and, but it's about, or, you know, it might be about 60 to 65% energy return. So every foot strike, when you, when you land on the ground, you compress the shoe foam and you essentially put energy into that foam. And then when you unload your body, the foam squishes back. Cause it really think of a shoe foam as acting like a spring. You compress it down, energy gets stored as potential energy, and then it compresses back. Some of that energy pushes back and compresses back, but some is lost to heat. And so in EVA, about 40, 35 to 40% is lost to heat. Mm -hmm. And then this expanded TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane um, in Boost uh, was better. It, it was about 70, 70 even 75% of the mm -hmm. So, So you essentially bump that energy return back. So you lose a little bit less. It was a little bit more heavy still than EVA though. So. So there was, I believe there was a study early on that found that it improved running economy by about 1% in runners. Um, so that, you know, that slightly more advantageous energy return seemed to be a good thing. Um, and logically speaking, it should be. But again, that the weight factor is, is certainly certainly an issue. Um, but the other thing that's interesting too is, is it's a little bit stiffer than most EVAs. Um, and so this is the other dominant term that we'll talk about is the stiffness. Or the compliance, the inverse. We talked about that in the past, but how much it compresses down. Mm -hmm. So if it's stiff shoe, 
under your foot strike will not compress very much. A very soft or compliant shoe will compress a lot under that same load. And so these these um, TPUs at the time were pretty pretty stiff. So they returned a lot of energy, but because they were stiff, you actually couldn't really store that much energy in them because they didn't compress that much. So it was a bit of a wash. It was like a bit of a sidestep. Yeah. Um, but and actually, a really funny, interesting backstory or backstory on TPU. Um, that that uh, um, that project with BASF, the chemical company, um, it actually started with Puma. I think oh, in no 2009, Puma started working huh. with BASF to develop this compound, and then BASF. I don't know the whole. I don't know how this this uh, relationship shook out, but I'm sure I'm sure some of the shoe geeks in your audience know the contentious history between Puma and Adidas. But BASF to Todd. essentially like <laughs> sidestepped and ditched Puma and started working with Adidas on this, which is like, um, man, you know, uh, it's a it's a a little bit of a interesting uh, relationship there. Um, so they started started dating a different chick. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so then they developed this con- con- this this thing that they had been working on with Puma. They kind of continued it with Adidas, and of course, it became this behemoth that Adidas, Adidas still the boost you know boost still drives all of their like athleisure stuff, right? And, uh, whatever. Um, but so Puma actually sued BASF over this, and it was only settled. It was settled in like 2016. Oh wow! And because they then like Puma tried to start the project up with an American chemical company and got it going. Um, and then I think they there's, they might still be settling this law, lo- like figuring this lawsuit out. Cause I think as of the late 2000 teens, it still hadn't met its conclusion yet, but they were, I mean, they're, they're essentially suing Adidas for like, this was, this was our thing that you, you know, you took and started. And uh, so it was settled to a point in 2016 to allow Puma to use that tech, um, which that was, interestingly, was right before Puma stopped making running shoes, <laughs> they had this line of TPU shoes that at the time Adidas might have been the only one, and it was called like, what was it called, like, N- it was like NRG, yep. like, was the name of the foam, but it was, it was like the only other TPU foam on the market at the time, but then Puma, like, you know, shuttered, shuttered their running business, but then, you know, they've come back in a big yeah. way since then but so anyways that's like that's a lot of people don't know that but it's just another awesome chapter in the like bloodbath between puma and adidas for people that don't so. don't know look into the history between puma and adidas that bsf jumping ship like that is when you said like dating a new chick it's basically like hey you're dating a girl and then you decide to go date her sister and just switch yes so yeah, yeah. no wonder there's yeah. lawsuits it's like and her fighting. sister that she hates yeah that she yeah. absolutely yeah. has hated for <laughs> How many years now? Like, uh, yeah, like, are we approaching a hundred years? Yeah, it's a long time. So, anyway, Jeff, do you have do yeah. you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, okay. we can. Yeah, we're, we're okay. Yeah. For really, okay, cool. Good, good so, if you had to, Keep if on. you had to, you know, we went through EVA, talked about TPU. I think the other ones that we hear a lot about now are super critical foams. That term is just thrown out there all the time. And so, what yeah. does that mean? And then we got to hit PBAC, PBA, PBACs. Yeah, so, yeah. So we can we can hit each of those in kind of a, a nice swoop here. So yeah, so ever since so then you know the the next one that really shook up the market in this so we can kind of finish the story or not finish but like in it was then the vapor fly in 2016 and the and the PBAX in it and so this foam was you know like I said we kind of have that you know TPU versus EVA. Um, you know, like I said, it was a bit of a sidestep. TPU, better energy return, a little bit stiffer, a little bit heavier. So it was kind of a wash for some. Maybe there's an argument to be made that it was slightly more beneficial and we just couldn't detect it. I don't know. Anyways, so then of course everybody knows in in twenty well in twenty seventeen it launched, but it started winning races in twenty sixteen. <laughs> um, yeah, the vapor fly with Nike, and they used this um, they used this compound called. Uh, it was the trade name is PBAX, but the chemical name is PIBA, polyether block amide. And so this is, um, you know, maybe a little little bit of a polymer chemistry lesson for your listeners. And for me. But when you hear, um, yeah, um, 
when you hear the term like polyurethane or polyamide, um, that actually refers to the link that is joining these uh, molecules in in the in the shoe or in the shoe in the foam and in, in whatever it is. Um, so you can think of a, a polymer is essentially just a repeating unit of a you know of a molecule. So you can think of them as bricks or Lego blocks. And so, so I would actually say the way that you can think about this is like they are so the what we would call monomers, the single units of the molecule. Um, then you, of course, expand them out and there are a polymer. Um, and the the name of that, re, the name of the polymer is usually a reference to the way that they're linked. So a polyamide is the amide are the links between each of these um, uh, monomers. But the actual chemical inside that is, is or the actual monomer and structure of, it's a very, usually a very complex carbon chain, um, or maybe not complex, but anyways, it's a carbon, usually a carbon chain. Anyways, the, um, yeah, so you can have all sorts, so there are lots of different types of polyamides um, and lots of different types of polyurethanes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the but the the amide is the thing that joins it. So if we want to use the Lego brick analogy, it's like the amide is the the circles that connect the bricks. Um, so like polyurethane might be squares, and polyamide might be the circles. Um, so it's essentially different ways to connect them. Um, and of course, that then begs different actual chemicals themselves. But so, anyways, getting back to PIBA. So is this this um, yeah, this polymer called polyether block amide, which means it's this um, polyether and the amide are essentially joined together and then repeating units of that, and it can give very distinct properties. And this had been used for a long time as a plastic, or like a, or what we would kind of colloquially term a plastic, like um, like ski boots had PIBA as you know, like or. Um, uh, actually, a lot of running shoes yeah. had it as those plastic like shanks on the bottom. Mizuno, for any of your listeners, you know the like Mizuno wave technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, those waves were like PBAX um, uh, rigid pieces. Yeah. But so, anyways, um, they this French chemical company figured out a way to start foaming it, and it <clears> had <throat> one of the reasons why it was used um, for so long in. Uh, um, one of one of the reasons why it was used so long in like these rigid plastics is because it has really favorable properties of like energy return, th uh, temperature resistance, things like that. So, anyways, this this um, this company and and it wasn't just the company. It was actually there's this is a little bit even more complex. But there's a I believe a I don't even know how these all interact, <laughs> but there's a company called Zote Foams which actually works I think with the um, the chemical company Arkema is the one that makes PBAX, but Zote Foams I think was the one that figured out how to manufacture this chemical into a foam, um, or at least they worked together on it. And this had been in the works for a very long time um, and kind of through actually different iterations before it even became the kind of Zumex foam hmm. that you know now. But so anyways, so they found a way to, to take this this new polymer and foam it. Um, and it ended up having these properties that were fantastic for running shoes. Um, that, you know, getting back to EVA, um, you know, it was, yeah, so so it was, it had more energy return. So it was, whereas EVA was 60, 65%, that TPU and boost was, you know, 70, 75%. This stuff was like 85 plus percent. Mm -hmm. So it was nearing a perfect spring. It's crazy. Um, but then the other wild thing was it was so much softer. So it was less stiff, so it could squish down a lot. So those two dominant material properties that we think about with, with shoes and foams is the compliance or the stiffness, so how much it squishes down, and then the resilience, the energy return, how much it squishes back. So those two things really are the kind of dominant things. And so it really, and this gets back to maybe one of the things we talked about the beginning but the surfaces our bodies really like soft surfaces compliant surfaces um so there's some cool studies on uh like a, a treadmill 
that this team at Harvard manipulated the compliance of the treadmill and the softer and softer they got it, the more and more efficient runners were. So their running economy was just getting better and better and mm-hmm. better as they made it softer and softer and softer. And so this was, so our bodies kind of really like that. Um, and again, it gets back to the softer and softer a spring is, if it has the same amount of energy return, the more and more energy you can store in it. Um, so anyways, so this, this new foam was softer, so it was more compliant and more resilient. And then just to like really crush, it was also way less dense than EVA mm-hmm. and certainly than TPU, so it was lighter. So, you know, I like to say it's like, it's like having your cake and eating it too and then going back for some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it really, and, and of course the results you know, then speak for themselves. Um, yeah. It's changed the sport as we know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so anyway, so that was this, this kind of new polymer. And since then there's been this like, you know, growing awareness of, of different, different polymers and, and different, different things to use. And, and, it, and this is, this is, um, uh, um, this is something that is tricky because um, <laughs> these 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 foams like and maybe we can get and I, I we can after finish this thought we can maybe talk about how we test them because this is something I've done in my lab quite a bit um, but these foams are not ubiquitous so one EVA is not like the other EVA mm-hmm. and one even one TPU is not like the others but also one PIBA is not necessarily like the others um, because they, they, these are like the broad classes, you know, of chemicals. Um, but the way that you turn them into foams, the way that you even kind of mix those ingredients all affect the properties. Um, and so just because one foam is one type doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be um, equal to the yeah. others. That being said, they are also there are levels that are jumped. So like a PIBA foam is probably going to be more favorable than an EVA foam. From um, a running economy standpoint. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, but like a TPU, you can have enormous spectrum of, of things that you can do with how you manufacture that into a foam. Moreover, we're now entering a place where like one of the steps in technology is actually blending EVA with some of these other polymers. Mm. Um, so you could have EVA that's blended with TPU, or we haven't even talked about lots of, there are a lot of other um, other elastomers out there. So this term, thermoplastic elastomer, TPE, all of these foams fall under that class. Okay. Um, and, and so I think actually a part of me is, is, is like wondering if like we're now entering a point almost where like you don't like at least from a performance standpoint, companies almost don't want to say we have an EVA shoe. That's almost like a <laughs> it's almost like a uh, uh, like an embarrassing thing <laughs> to say. Um, it's like, oh, yeah, it's EVA. Yeah. I, I think um, I've seen a company but, like but I think say use it instead of saying EVA like, yeah, we have a TPE material. And I'm like. Yeah. So yeah, so those I are all of them. Yeah. If that's gonna happen. Yeah. Is like you're gonna start to say like, oh, we have this TPE, and it's like, well, what is it? Like you, that's like that's like saying that's, that's like, a huge like, like for me. Have, yeah. Or I was gonna say it's like if you have something on a menu, it's like we have this new meat. Yeah. It's like, okay. What kind? Is it chicken? Is it beef? Is it pork? Yeah, it's, and then within each of those, you have enormous like. Insect. It's so, actually mystery anyways. meat, actually. So it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but well, I was going to say that's actually one of the interesting things, though, is these companies that might say this is a TPE. It actually could be a blend. It could be a mystery foam, or it could be this. It could be something that has EVA with you know some sort of other elastomer blended in there and foamed. Um, yeah, so there are there are definitely different ways that that companies are doing this, and so I think the problem with that now is like you can't you can't necessarily judge the you don't know the mechanical properties of a foam just by the name yeah. of it. Um, and then the other the other point the other thing that can further modify that, and you alluded to this earlier, is this concept of quote unquote super, super critical. critical fluids. Yeah, and this is important because this is 
this is probably one of the big things that is you're seeing most companies now using this because it is it is the way that you can kind of transform the properties of lesser phones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so what it is is I referred to earlier. You use a blowing agent to get to turn this kind of like you know chemical soup into a foam and set it into a foam. And so a supercritical fluid is one that is, you know, you operate in uh, a, at a certain temperature and pressure where it is what we call, it's no longer a liquid or a gas. It's a quote unquote supercritical fluid. And so the ones that mm. you use most commonly that you can do that with are carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Nitrogen. And so both of these carbon dioxide is a gas and, and, and nitrogen is a gas. But at, you know, at certain temperatures and pressures, those can be liquids, um, but because because of their um, chemical properties, it's relatively easy to get them into this kind of like magical supercritical state um, where they have. Um, I'm going to get this wrong, and, and we can have we can have polymer chemists come on to, to correct me on this. <laughs> we we take them if but, they uh, came. <laughs> yeah, um, but but yeah. So when they're when when you introduce it into the foam in this state. And then you, you know, whether it's drop the temperature or drop the pressure, you can then allow it to, to move into that gaseous state and you can really alter the, the chemical properties of that foam in a, in a different way than just using kind of a conventional gas in there. So it really is a way to get more um, defined, I would say, like molecular architecture mm -hmm. to that foam. Um, because one of the interesting things with these, with these, um, uh, with these foams is like, especially EVA, on a molecular level, they're really pretty sloppy. Um, mm. Like they're not, uh, they're not uniform. Cause again, you're just mixing these two very kind of crude chemicals together. Um, and so when you have highly ordered chemical structures or like I would say not very ordered chemical structures, um, you get, you, you don't have as, um, so you don't have as you the, the properties are maybe not, not as as favorable yeah um and so that's where like the the p buff comes in or or some of these other next generation mm -hmm. polymers is they're they're much more structured so by having that polyether block amide chemical structure those blocks are have very ordered ways that they fit together and so you can get this very predictable very um well you know, molecularly constructed, you know, architecture. Whereas like EVA, it'd be akin to like not even having those connectors, you know, not squares. It'd just be like little Lego cubes that you kind of like, I don't know, like glue together or something. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, so, so the, by using the supercritical fluids, you can do, you can do two big things that, that come into the foams that change them to be more favorable, similar to like, the PBA. One, you can make them much less dense. So you can make them a lot lighter. Um, so that's the first thing is you can essentially introduce a lot more gas and make it much more and make it as stable. Um, so you can make it lighter, which is more favorable. But by making it lighter, you can also make it softer. So it's a way to make the EVA or even, you know, TPU or something even softer and squishier. Um, and then this is something that I don't know. Um, but I would hypothesize might be an element is there, I, I could also see a case of maybe if that blowing agent changes the chemical structure, maybe for a bit, it could be a little bit more resilience. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, I haven't, I've only tested in our lab, like I think two, and I don't have all the results from one of them yet, or maybe three of um, like super critical foams. Yeah. And one of them was not substantially different on the energy return, okay. um, but then a, then the non super critical version of it. Um, but anyways, the uh, yeah, so so anyways, you can change the properties favorably. And what's interesting is those two common super critical fluids, nitrogen versus carbon dioxide, um, those have their own hmm. like uh, interesting properties, the way that they affect the shoes. And I think uh, generally speaking, carbon dioxide in lots of industrial ap applications is widely used as a supercritical fluid because it's it's more easy it's more easy to handle. Um, it can get in that state. I think in it's more in that state in 
it's easier to get it in the different um, like thermodynamic conditions. So it's more widely used. And so I think, but the problem is, is I think with shoes, um, it is, it's a little bit cheaper to do because it's again, more ubiquitous. Um, but I don't think it, it creates as favorable properties mm -hmm. as doing it with nitrogen. Um, and I talked to a, um, somebody who worked in one of the major shoe companies and was saying like nitrogen is generally, um, like one of the things that affects is the longevity of those properties, like how the shoe holds up. Um, and nitrogen is a lot more expensive to work with, um, generally, but, but is more favorable, especially in the longevity of the properties of it. And I think one of the ways that you can look at that is like, maybe some of your, some of you guys remember the first iteration of the Brooks Hyperion, which like, yes, famously just went out the window after like, Two 50 runs, miles maybe one they run. said like 30 to, they even <laughs> said 30 to 50 miles yeah. right yeah. they're like yeah and and so i think that's an example of like taking this kind of like a, like a maybe a not great foam and introducing this thing that gives it these really favorable properties but it's it's like you can't overcome some of the fundamental um attributes of it you know it's like <laughs> I had this boss. I, I worked for General Motors in Poland for a little bit, and I had this. My boss there was like the most. Um, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a straight shooter, but he had lots of like awesome injections of wisdom. There's this thing he always said was, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And so, so like, I think of that as kind of like maybe some iterations of some super, you know, critical. super critical EVAs are like lipstick on a pig. Um, <laughs> but. Anyways. I know you wanted to talk about um, testing a little bit, yeah. but before we do that, even what you have talked about a couple terms, you talked about stiffness, you talked about resilience is re is resilience differentiated from another term you just use is longevity just because it's resilient. doesn't mean it'll last a long time, right? Those are different things. Very, Very different. different. Very just different. to clarify yep. that. Cause I think resilience yep. could yeah, sound so like a durability thing, but that's not what it yeah. is. Great. Yeah. So let's use durability then. So the, the properties that we would think about would be stiffness and resilience of the, you know, essentially of the foam. So stiffness being the essentially the inverse of the softness, resilience being how much energy it returns or how much energy is lost. Um, and then durability being how well those two properties hold up over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and so that's that's the dominant thing that you then think about with these foams. And so getting back to re maybe really tying all that together. So Piba, you know, Piba was this new foam. But what's interesting is, like, the other foams that you're, you're seeing, you know, come out is, like, a lot of them we might, we're, unfortunately, we're not, we're not getting what they are. <laughs> um, some of the companies will say what they are. Some won't. Many won't. Um, but like, for example, like the new Asics shoe that's out, I don't know exactly what foam it is, but I've heard, I think I heard somewhere and I, 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 I got to find this reference, but I think it was one of the initial press releases that Asics might have had said it was a nylon. Yeah, that's what they said yes, to it us. Is. Yep. Yeah. And, and do you know what nylon is? I do not. Nylon <laughs> is a polyamide. Mm -hmm. So, so like a polyether block amide has nylon in it and like so it's essentially a foamed polyamide so it probably has very similar properties to a piba and that is playing out I'm currently working through an analysis on these and it is and you know dustin's study also showed that it was you know one of the better performing ones mm -hmm. but you put it on and it feels similar to the you know a piba foam mm -hmm. and so that's what like yeah nylon is just part of that um it is that chemical that's in it's the polyamide so so yeah so we think about that it's like disentangling these is is there's a lot of overlap but it's also gets back to this idea that these are just con, you know molecular constituents that also have a, a substantial bearing on um you know how they're turned into a foam um and so anyways so the thing that we're then left with is what are their properties so what are those you know those fundamental mechanical properties. And that's something that, you know, I've, um, a, it's some ongoing research that I'm doing right now, but also, um, uh, yeah, it's something that I think is, I wish was, was like 
um, something that is wi like widely published on shoes. Like there's the more that I've done this, the more that I've thought is something that's like, I need to have, and it's bummer. Cause now that I'm not at Michigan anymore, I don't have the testing machine that <laughs> used to do this. But I'm like, I want to create a database of just running shoes and the, the foam. Yes. Of that. Like this is something. And the sad thing is like runner's world actually does this like in their shoe testing lab, but I, they don't publish the results because like, I don't know if it's partially because of, you know, having ties to, you know, the shoe companies like largely are drivers of revenue. Um, but yeah, anyway, so how do we test these shoes? Um, really quick, the way that you quick comment on that. Yeah. I, I have a friend of mine who does that professionally testing a lot of the stuff for the companies and they cannot publish it because these, these mechanical properties are proprietary information. So if the company doesn't want to share it, Neither can you if you're doing that testing. So if, if you're working for well, them, wait, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, wait for later this year, and and I will hopefully have a paper. Yes, that Sweet. we'll look forward to <laughs> it. Um, we yeah. can. Anyway, we'd love to be an outlet for your future endeavors. You can just yeah, pump it out know. on our site. Yeah, yeah. Like we can just have um, a resource yeah. up for people um, if you want to work um, on that. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. So anyway, so how you test these foams? Um, you know, it's funny. One of the things that persisted for so long as the like number one thing that was the property that shoes are reported on is their durometer yes. and i'm sure you guys have heard this and durometer is a that's that's measures the hardness of a of a material and hardness versus stiffness is like these are two properties that are say tightly correlated but not the same mm. And so for a long time, shoes are just reported and even companies still like use durometer as kind of the bearing. And what a durometer is, is the resistance of a material to indentation um, or the hardness is resistance to indentation. So a durometer, the way that you would measure that in a shoe is like the things that you do this, are, they're literally like almost look like like gauges, like yeah. they're like hand gauges, like a dial. And you just put it on the surface of the shoe and it gives you this number and they're different different durometers have different scales and like sizes of the indentation and so it's really it's 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 a somewhat um there's not a ton of external validity to it in the sense that the durometer value is really contingent on the setup like again the the type of indentation it's doing and the the scale and so the shoes i think are usually asker c durometers which you could google an asker c durometer if you really want one you could buy one and do it on your own shoes um but i i always kind of like rejected i i, I it left me scratching my head because i'm like that's easy because it tells you like on the surface what how it is but it doesn't tell you how the foam is functioning um in the system of the, shoe. All the links because like talked about yeah yeah but also like you know, like when you compress a shoe, like there, again, there are just so many more, um, uh, that it's just not at all representative, I think, of how you are loading the shoe, but also is not a generalizable material property in the sense of like the, that is contingent entirely on that type of durometer testing you're doing. Whereas if you measure the stiffness of the foam, that should be true no matter what load that you put on it, no matter what pressure you put on it, no matter what, you know, loading rate you put on it, if it's a elastic, if it's a linearly elastic material, which these foams are to a certain degree, um, it should, that should be a generalizable concept. So I'm like, why don't we use this? And one of the reasons is it's tough to do that to test the stiffness of a shoe foam. A durometer is nice because it's this little handheld device you can put on it. It's like cheap and easy. But so to do materials testing, to measure the energy return and the stiffness of any material, but say the running shoe foam, you need a materials testing machine. And they're usually what we would call servo hydraulic machines. And they are, um, they're beautiful in their simplicity, but incredibly complex. Like, so what they do, um, broadly speaking, is just load load something in a usually what we'd call uniaxial loading, which is just up and down. So you can think of these machines are giant pistons that have a load cell on the bottom that senses how much load is being put into the surface. And then it has a very accurate um, 
call a uh, displacement measure. You're usually what we would call a linear variable displacement transducer, I think, LVDT. Um, but anyway, so it's this highly accurate way of measuring how much load something, you know, essentially a scale on the bottom, a force cell, load cell, um, and then a piston going up and down to measure the exact displacement. And so these are, it's so simple. It's just this piston going up and down, measuring the force and the displacement. But these things are going to cost you probably, you know, six figures a lot of times. And they're like the one that, you know, in our lab is like it spans two rooms because it's like the whole testing frame. And then it goes next door into the whole hydraulic system because these things are, again, like, you know, this is for me when I'm testing shoes, I want to simulate a foot strike. So I need it to deliver the load of a human <laughs> over fractions of a second and do it over and over and over so that's essentially like this gunshot but it has to be this gunshot that's like highly controlled and so it's this very simple movement that's just thump, 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 thump on the shoe but very tightly controlled um yeah so anyway so you need one of these machines <laughs> and so it's a little bit tougher and i think what's crazy is is like it's i mean like most, I would say a lot of the shoe companies probably have these, but some of them don't even mm. have these in their testing labs, which is just like crazy. Um, but so, so anyways, this is this simple piece of equipment, albeit like a somewhat dangerous and expensive piece of machinery, <laughs> um, can be used to get these properties. In the foams. And so what you do is, is like I said, you, you set it up where you just have this piston compressing the foam and telling you how much you know, say I want to load it to a thousand newtons or two thousand newtons, you know, which is what a, a human body, what you it, it's runner might typically put on it. So it, it loads the loads the shoe to two thousand newtons and then pulls it back off, and you tune it, you know, through different um, yeah different different ways you kind of tune the electronics on it to do it in the right time course. So if you want to do it in you know one hundred fifty milliseconds or two hundred milliseconds, like a foot strike. Um, you do that. And from that, you can get the properties of, again, the stiffness of that foam and the, um, yeah. And the, and the energy. Wow. Right. And, and, uh, I have, um, there is an article that I, I just, you know, this is like the first vapor fly study, um, that came out of the university of Colorado. They have a really nice, there's a really nice graphic in there that shows what one of these graphs looks like that comes out of these that, um, you know, through these three different, the three different shoes of the different types of foams. Um, so your listeners, if they want to see that, can go check it out. I'm sure a lot of your listeners have already yeah. read that paper. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But, yeah, so that's that's how we test the shoes and test the foams. And this is something I've done in, again, you know, I've done in my lab. And, and I had a lot of experience. Uh, I alluded to, you know, breaking bones and ripping tendons. So years ago, I was actually using these exact same machines to test these like biological materials Amazing. So now is pretty cool. This like the last year or two going back into the lab that I used to work in and like, you like, yes, now I don't have to put on all, well, I was going to say now I don't have to put on the PPE, but I still had to like wear masks and stuff because of the right. pandemic. But like, it's like, this is so great. I don't have to worry about like getting blood and like biological fluid or stuff. It's just shoes. It's easy. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's been cool to, to work through and these different, you know, these different foams have very different properties. And getting back to that idea of even the same broad types of chemicals are very different. So, like, Saucony has a PIBA shoe, um, which, you know, kudos to them for being one of the first ones to get on that. Um, but the PIBA foam in there has different properties than the Vaporfly, which is a PIBA foam. Yeah. Whereas, you know, and what's really interesting is they both have very similar energy return. Um, they're both, you know, I've measured both of them right around 85, 86%, hmm. but the vapor fly is much softer. It's much more compliant. Yeah. It has a lower stiffness. Um, so I measure that typically at around 40 kilonewtons per meter and the sock shoe have had it like 70 to 80. So almost twice as stiff. You can um, feel that for sure. Yeah, you can definitely. Exactly. When you're running. And, and what's interesting is sock has a different, um, approach to foaming that that chemical where it's it's similar to what boost was Beated. where we call it like expanding it in the pellets mm -hmm. yeah um and so they put it into pellets and then compress it down into a shoe so it gives it slightly different properties um and and then the same thing with like 
a lot of the different companies now have have these different, you know, say like super critical foams that might have very similar chemical constituents, um, but just the way that they're manufactured, you know, comes out being quite dis- quite distinct. So, yeah, so it's where where I think for a long time I I was. I would say early on, I was very much like, man, we just need the the chemical names of these foams and that would just make everything so much easier. I still want that. That would still be very important. Sure. Like I wish we had details on it. But now I've also through going through this, like, you know, have, have seen and, and hopefully that's what like the, you know, our research and stuff will, will, will show and highlight as well is like, it's like, yeah, this is also, you know, it, it differs even within the, the, same category. category and it's like we really just need we need a consumer report for running <laughs> shoes um, seriously to tell us the the properties of these foams and then we didn't even get into the other the other concepts of the other ways that these are the durability of yes them. that's like what i was going to ask you these hold up over time and then also the, the the other really big thing that's interesting is the um uh um the thermo uh thermosensitivity Yes. Of how they hold up under different temperatures, because those are two enormous things. So I'll say a few things to those. Cool. Ones. I was going to ask, can we get um, like a cliff notes? Because we can't dive all the way in. Oh, but... Yeah, um, I'll try and keep it somewhere between cliff notes and novel. <laughs> um, no, hey, we uh, have time. Whatever you give us, yeah, we're good. Um, so so the, um, the durability is a really interesting question on this, because one, EVA is not great for that. It is that concept of, you know, like I always loved like 300 to 500 miles. It's like, it's like, that sounds, that sounds fun to, or that's easy to say. <laughs> like I, cause I can't tell you how many times I told that to somebody when I worked in a running, when I worked in the running store, like, you know, thousands of people would come through and that's just the answer. I get 300, 300, 500 miles. And it's like, it's so, it's, it's just ridiculous to think about that now that I look, think back and I'm like, that's like, those are two very different numbers. <laughs> um, like, if we're operating on a logarithmic scale, they're pretty like three three hundred and five hundred are very different realities. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so but the but what's interesting is those properties change. I would say, like for most, even say the way that you the every everybody is going to load a shoe differently. Um, and then the way that you load them, the way that you use them might even have bearings on that longevity, um, the way that you stress and, you know, that foam. But so broadly speaking, EVA was not good for durability. Um, I mean, it was good in the sense of like 300 to 500 miles. <laughs> um, but I would say it, it doesn't, it, it does start to decay. Um, like if you were to simulate that 300 to 500 miles in a very controlled test environment, it starts to decay after what the 100 would be simulated and goes down to, um, you know, 300, it's like noticeably falling off mm-hmm. and 500 more. And there are like a handful of studies that have done this and that's where those numbers come mm-hmm. from. Um, but the way that we load them in the wild is so much different than that. But also like that idea of how much those properties decaying over that time, like how much of that matters? And is there, at some point, is there something that it, that becomes like, I don't know, somewhat catastrophic? The other interesting thing that, that I'm very curious about, and this is one of the things that I, I'm sad that I kind of left. This is, a, this is a line of research that I would have done if I had kind of stayed in an academic realm, but the way that we regionally load our shoes. Mm-hmm. So like, you can think of our shoe we, we stress different regions of that foam very differently. Yeah. Um, and so I suspect that that is where different levels of breakdown happen. But so anyways, so these properties, you know, how that softness and resilience holds up, um, it breaks down a bit in EVA and it's somewhat gradual, I would say, um, in the sense of, you know, it, it's somewhat stable for for very early on in the loading. So if we want to throw a number like you know, hundred miles or so, but then it does start to decay a bit. Um, and then that rate of decay is, you know, different for every person and, and the time scale is different. The, the TPU, that was one of the shocking things about that 
foam is is it did not decay like eBay. Mm -hmm. It held up its properties really, really well. I actually had a, a teammate in college, um, this kid from New Zealand, uh, uh, Brendan Blacklaws. I hope he's listening. He's awesome, mm -hmm. awesome dude. He took a pair of boots and he he would run them until they were until they were like wear through the foam. <laughs> like he'd put thousands of miles on. Them. Um, it was crazy. And I mean, I, I'm somebody who, once I started to kind of like get in tune with this, I would be ditching EVA shoes after probably three to 400 miles. 400 was the upper limit for mm -hmm. me. And, um, but a lot of them, especially lighter weight, like racing ones would be gone maybe even before 300. Um, I remember that I, I didn't really do much running in boost, but Saucony had a TPU shoe, um, for, or you know, a lot of shoes that were made with that same expanded TPU. Um, and I, I put like six or 700 miles on a pair of those and get rid of them just out of like, this is still good, but I don't want, I don't want to have like a blow up like, or something. I just, like, I, I don't know. Like I, I, there's no reason rationally for me to not get rid of these, but I feel like I've just violated something. Here. Um, but yeah, so that holds up really, really well. And part of it is just that chemical, that more ordered, uh, hmm. more robust chemical structure um, is is more stable and more durable. Um, now, what's crazy is that the Piva foams, um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people said early on about the Vaporfly was like, oh, like you got to use it sparingly because it doesn't last very long, you know. And I was always curious about this because I'm like, well, that's a it's a favorable chemical composition. Um, and we've actually another study that this probably will never get published, but we just did it for fun. We had um, one of the things this the orthopedic research lab that I used to work in. One of the things they were famous for at Michigan is like they do um, nano CT imaging of bones and like so like the micro architecture of bones. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the researchers in that lab was a you know collaborator and friend of mine. So similar, he's a running geek. Um, we we did we took the nano CT and put shoe foams in them, um, <laughs> and looked at the micro architecture of the foams, and the the Piba is crazy how like just perfectly like ordered it is. Um, whereas like the the Boost foam and the expanded TPUs are really funny because they're like within these even within the pellets, yeah. um, there's like enormous variability of of the way it's wow. ordered and and I mean you can see that I think I could see why that would might be more robust and and i don't know more stable but certainly heavier and more dense but anyways the people it's just so highly ordered mm -hmm. um but so anyways i i thought i'm like well you know this is this chemical compound you know like the 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 block amides um like these like this is this should be like you know, pretty strong and sturdy um and so sure enough, I, I've tested on that, you know, that materials testing machine I was talking about. I've done these compliance and resilience tests on vapor flies that I put over 300 miles mm -hmm. on. Um, and the, it's insane how well they wow. hold up. Like it was still, the, the resilience on them was still, you know, 84%, wow. which was like crazy. Um, the compliance was very similar. They, and really the, the way that for me, they weren't runnable anymore because I had ripped up the outsole. Yeah. So they were really, I, I, I tell people now those shoes are limited, not by the foam, by the foam properties, but really by the, um, the mechanical, like exterior, wow. um, the, the, the structural integrity of, of that. So, you know, I think, I think Dustin, the, Dustin the, did a case study with his alpha flies too, where he did yeah. it. I forget. It was at 420 kilometers he had put on the shoe. Yeah. Um, and I know he's going to yep. keep adding more, so it'll be, and that's a case study. Yeah. So what it is, yeah, but, the economy but it, wasn't that sounds that different. That was sounds impressive. consistent. Like yeah. with what you're seeing. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's, so it's, so I think that the new phones, that's one of the things that's very exciting for me with those is like, they hold up better than EVA, which is, mm -hmm. um, and then finally, that last question of, of temperature. Yeah, this is another thing that talks about you know, lipstick on a pig. <laughs> EVA is a disaster in, 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 across temperature ranges. Um, when it gets cold, that compliance, like the stiffness of it, it goes through the roof. It gets so stiff mm -hmm. when it's cold. Um, and then that, I think that 
Uh, I don't actually know what happens to the resilience, but if you have an extremely stiff shoe, doesn't really um, matter. It doesn't even really matter what the resilience is because you're not putting much energy into it anyway. If a shoe, um, if a shoe gets really cold, but then you bring it inside mm-hmm. and it warms up, does it return to its previous properties, or do you lose some? Yes. Okay. I was curious about that because yeah, I get them delivered an outside I, in Wisconsin, and you know it's like negative yeah, twenty, and I take I it out, it. and it's a brick. It's literally like a brick. And I I'm like, it. do I, I get this I, shoe I'm, back? I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. Where I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to be there when I don't want to expose to the elements for that long. <laughs> like, but I think um, rational. This is that's like an irrational. Yes, okay. I think rationally speaking, it, it. That being said, though, I don't know. You know, and I don't think this has been done. This was like another study that I really wanted to do. Was like, was like, was that that like temperature cycling? Like, what happens if we make this cold? use it and then bring it back is there is there some loss right there? and one of the thing one of the big things that happens with eva is the gas loss in the actual foam um so i could see i i don't have a good answer for that but i could see a case where it does i mean broadly speaking it does recover properties but but does it fully completely recover her properties i don't know i i i'm with you where i'm like neurotic about <laughs> like the, the condition which would with, with which we treat our, our footwear i text um, jana jana yeah, she's I, getting delivered today can you check yeah. yeah but i do think that they like they lose like if if worn over time in the cold like i i get less life out of my shoes in the winter mm-hmm. for sure um or my old you know back when it was eva shoes um so i i've long suspected that they wear out faster but maybe that's back to like stiffening up you 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 i don't know regionally load the shoe differently or something i don't know but anyways so so temperature stability um eva not good um but the tpus were really good and i think um that's the other thing with with the the new generation of the other these other chemical compounds um that are more more ordered more ordered uh predictable polymers um yeah, they, they perform really well across temperatures. Now, the one thing that's interesting is carbon fiber. This is something to maybe pique the interest of listeners. I think carbon fiber is pretty stable across temperatures. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, it's just stiff all the time. Um, at low temperatures, it does get a little bit stiffer, but not drastically. But some of the, some of the other... Um, lesser fiber glasses so carbon fiber is actually a type of fiber glass but other ones that might be nylon for example um, those are more sensitive to temperature than than carbon fiber especially if they're more compliant well, than carbon fiber so like some of those plates that are in shoes like um like maybe the Saucony ones or or even like the nike is it the zoom fly has a has a fiber glass plate in it that's not it's not carbon fiber um, and the the Saucony Endorphin Speed those... is the one that has the nylon plate in it. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, they yeah. Call it. Well, um, those might those might have a high degree of temperature sensitivity to them. Um, so that's something to keep in mm. mind. Um, that I I'm very curious about how that might affect um, people's interactions on in cold weather. But broadly speaking, the newer generation of shoes are more temperature stable. Um, now that being said, it, I also you know leave that to to question two of some of the super critical shoes of like how that affects the durability of them. Um, I don't know. I think, like I said, there's some kind of early thoughts that it, that it compromises the durability, some of them. Um, but, uh, again, maybe some of the more advanced methods or once they kind of get it dialed, because again, it's not saying a super critical fluid. Again, it's just a, a broad class of getting air (laughs) into that, foam and it can have depending on how it's done it can have any number this is something we didn't even touch on but we don't even know some of these newer elastomers that are used like a piba um those might have like i'm i and i wouldn't be surprised like if the the way that zoom x is foamed is using a supercritical fluid like the way that might be part of the way that they get it so light and so soft mm. um i don't know i would I wouldn't be surprised. Hmm. Um, so, like, even if it's not advertised, like, I think sometimes, you know, like, companies want to advertise it just because it sounds cool. Right. But some of them, that may be the default way that you get. So, like, I, I don't know. I'm just 
so I, I hope listeners don't take this as a gospel, but, um, but, but be thinking about it is like, you know, Nike or even Saucony who uses, you know, their, their, um, uh, Piba, those could have different, you know, different, whether super critical foam or blowing agents that are helping foam it or something, um, or ASICs could be doing that with, with whatever <laughs> similar foam, um, and just not advertised. The so one interesting one is something. The one interesting one could be Puma because they came out and they said we're a nitrogen infused Piba foam, and mm-hmm. so that could be where yeah. they're going from that. Uh, yeah, and like I said, and that that could be everybody. Again, maybe all Pibas might be. They might just be like marketing it. It sounded know? cool um, to us, you know, for the people who yeah, don't. Exactly. We don't even. This stuff is all awesome to hear because it's not yeah. our area of so expertise. When you, when you hear that, you should say like, "Oh, that's interesting. What's the resiliency?" Of yes. That? And then they'd be like, "Crick." <laughs> well, we're not going to tell <laughs> well, actually, you. No, I mean, no. I was going to say if it's a if it's a Piba, it's probably going to be a, quite a high resilience. So they'd be happy to. Do yeah. That. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but I think it it also like asking that question. I would just I would love if that just became like standard of like, oh cool, what's the resilience? What's the compliance? <laughs> like those two things. Yes. Like I don't care. I don't care about the durometer. Like tell me about tell me compliance mm-hmm. and resilience. Um, yeah. Awesome. So, well, Jeff, uh, it's been a, a privilege to have you on Dr. Jeff Burns. It brings, I think this perfect, you know, mesh of running experience, run work experience, engineering, biomechanics, shoe geekism. You kind of bring the whole gamut of everything. And so it makes talking to you a lot of fun and we probably could go on for another hour. Uh, and just this has been fantastic so thanks for giving us your time i think one of the biggest kind of kind of mind-blowing moments for me was just thinking of tpe as this umbrella that gets thrown out as almost a facade potentially for just another eva but you can call anything a tpe so uh just a lot of great things in here and and things that I think will influence how we review and think about shoes and the questions we ask. And we're in communication with companies all the time. And so talking to them about these things will be super valuable to us. And I'm sure everyone that got to listen. So thanks again for coming on the, coming on the show. My pleasure. And thanks for, yeah. Thanks for bringing me on and thanks for getting this out. And I think bringing, certainly bringing more, yeah, more objectivity to how we talk about shoes is, is I think critical. Cause like the way that, getting back to that idea of like these shoes being so individualized, I think the only way that we can to, to Matt's point about studying yourself and learning yourself, the only way that you can really dial that is if you know, if you have objective data on the thing you're trying to dial. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if we can be concrete about these things, then we can kind of better prescribe them for different people and learn how that affects. So, yeah. So, Love that you guys are, are doing this. And I re- really appreciate you having me on. This was a total blast. Fantastic. Thanks again. And if you want to keep following what we're doing, well, also, I have to say one more thing. If you're watching on YouTube, you got to see the sunset in LA because Matt is barely visible at this point. <laughs> and I've been trying to hold, I've been, every time I look at his screen, I start cracking up because you can only see like the hue of his face from his screen. It's hilarious. But uh, it's like he's under the blanket. Yeah. Like, yeah. Up late. I'm, do- I'm doing <laughs> campfire mode right sleeping. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have my fort. Don't make fun of me. It took a lot of work. (laughs) So, uh, again, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, We'll be updating those things. This podcast, uh, hopefully, will will be on all platforms available, and we'll have it out on YouTube. So, again, Dr. Jeff Burns, thank you so much for coming, and uh, we're excited to get this episode out to everybody. Awesome.